Hello, hello, hello. Hello, Senator. 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 H
They lied about it. They said to the people standing behind me that it wasn't true, that they were making it up, that there was nothing to be concerned about. Well, I tell you what, we're not going to accept that answer any longer. We are here today to get justice, and I've got good news for you. The United States Senate voted in a huge bipartisan vote to advance this legislation, to get this justice, not just for the men and women of St. Louis and St. Charles, Missouri, but for the men and women across this country who went into those mines, who risked their lives for this country, who worked hard, played by the rules, raised their families, and now they deserve to have their voices heard. Now they deserve to have respect. Now they deserve to be compensated. And that's what we're here to do. I can't wait to introduce to you a man it has been a privilege for me to work alongside in this fight, Senator Ben Ray Lujan of the state of New Mexico. Yeah. I say I feel a special, a special kinship with Senator Lujan because my wife is a New Mexican. So he, he represents a lot of family, uh, from, of my family. So I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the work that he has been doing for years, for years, to fight for justice. Would you join me in welcoming the senator from the great state of New Mexico, Ben Ray Lujan. Well, thank you all for coming today. Uh, I, I really appreciate this. Um, to all the journalists who are learning more and sharing more stories, and educating the country, I want to thank you. Because not too long ago, there was a film that was sharing with the American people a little bit more about the Manhattan Project, a film called Oppenheimer, um, a film where Dr. Oppenheimer and others and the work that they did in New Mexico around Los Alamos National Laboratory was told. Um, millions and millions of dollars were made off that film. Folks are watching it and they're streaming it. And I'm happy that story is being told because it's given an opportunity for all the families behind me here and countless others to shed light on an injustice that happened where so many of them as uranium mine workers were working in areas but not being told about the harms. Some of those uranium mine workers, they, they'd work in areas where they would fill the trenches with water to try to keep the particulate down. So families would get wet. And then their clothing would be full of yellow cake, right? That uranium ore, those particulates as they left. And they'd be told by the supervisors and managers out there, well, just wait till it dries, take it home. And when it dries, you can shake it. And it'll all come off, right? Well, when they'd shake that in a one room house with grandma and grandpa and with kids, who do you think was breathing that stuff in? So not only were those uranium mine workers getting sick, but then it was spreading to families and countless others. And the downwinders, everyone that has lived downwind of where nuclear testing took place, including in New Mexico, where the Trinity test site is, the first place that a bomb was tested on American soil, families are here that will attest you. They were not warned. Some of them found out about this because of what they heard, the light they saw. Others, when they got closer to home, they saw clothing that was out on a dry line after they washed it, full of ash. But no one's helped them. Not in the United States of America. Not when families were sacrificing for national security purposes. There was a berm in Church Rock, New Mexico that was holding uranium mine tailings that gave back in 1978, if I'm correct, Madam Speaker. No attention. Contaminated sheep, cattle, horses, families, crops. No justice. That's why I want to recognize Josh Hawley. You know, it surprised a lot of folks that a Democrat from New Mexico would work with a Republican colleague out of Missouri. <laughs> but it's one of those examples in how this place can work. Josh picked up the phone and gave me a holler when he was working on this amendment and said, is there a way that we can work on this together? I had the honor of working with Mike Crapo, another colleague of ours out of Idaho who's been leading this effort and doing incredible work. 
And Josh was not going to take no for an answer. He was not going to let this stand still. He said, let's find a solution. And we went to the floor with not enough votes. We knew we'd make a good showing. But Josh stood in the well, which is the area in front of the U.S. Senate chamber where the parliamentarian is and the presiding officer is where every senator goes to vote. And his colleagues would come up, and I was there to watch him and to learn from him. He talked to them. He earned their trust. And we went from some votes in the low 50s to 61. This vote needed 60. <laughs> Democratic and Republican members coming together. Champions like our colleague, Senator Schmidt, working together to get this done. And, and I just can't say enough because it's because of that wisdom, that thoughtfulness of the people of St. Louis and Missouri talking to their colleagues, trying to get things done, that we've been able to expand outreach and opportunity and earn more and more support. Our colleagues in the House, Representative Teresa Ledger Fernandez, a colleague from Guam, Representative Malloy, keeping this work going, educating colleagues. And when we were at an impasse a few years ago, you remember we were able to get an extension of this program when it was going to expire with the support of leaders like Jim Jordan, colleagues in the U.S. House of Representatives. And here we are again with a chance to make more progress to get this done. So we're asking for your support, for your prayers, your knowledge, your willingness to have conversations with more and more colleagues and educate them because we can correct this injustice in America. We can help more families. We can recognize those with the respect that they have earned, whether they were in those mines working for national security purposes or living in communities where this testing took place. In the United States, we can and we will get this done. And I wanna thank everyone for their courage to be here today. I'll close with this as they turn this over to Representative Malloy. There was a Navajo elder who was before a House committee when I was a member of the House. She was not able to be with us today. But she had the wisdom and courage to ask those on the panel that were not supportive, are you waiting for all of us to die so that the problem goes away? We're not. And your willingness to cover this, to tell these stories, is going to help these families as well. So thank you for being here again. With that, I want to turn this over to one of our House colleagues, the lead on the RICA legislation right now, Representative Malloy of Guam. So as we say, from Guam, buenas and half a day to everyone. And I'm Jim Wellen, representing the island of Guam. And it's an honor to stand here today as the House Republican co-lead for this important bipartisan measure introduced by both chambers of Congress. I want to begin by thanking my colleagues for their work on this issue, and especially Representative Teresa, Teresa Lajar Fernandez for asking me to join as the co-lead in this effort. I also want to thank Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri for the leading the way for this amendment and the Senate's National Defense Authorization Act, which would add the RICA language to the bill. His efforts, along with Senators Ben Ray Lujan and Mike Crapel, were successful and are now part of the Senate's NDAA. This is a welcome news to Guam, where many of my constituents deal with this adverse effect to the exposure of toxic radiation an issue that is compounded by the need to fly off island, either to Hawaii or the Philippines to get the care that they so desperately need. It is also important to recognize the advocacy efforts of the Pacific Association of Radiation Survivors, PARS. Now this nonprofit organization has worked timelessly over the years to ensure that Guam is included in RICA. Mr. Robert Celestra of PARS is here with us today, so thank you and your members. Ensuring that RICA measures that are enacted into law is priority of mine, and I will continue to advocate this issue. Ensuring that those who have been affected by the radiation exposure are properly compensated in the utmost, is the utmost importance, and I look forward to working with the members 
appointed to the NDAA Conference Committee to pass this legislation and help ease the pains of those who have been exposed to toxic levels of radiation. We are very, very close to the finish line and it would take massive undertaking to an education process to get us there. And I'm optimistic that we will get there. So thank you and I want to now introduce and turn this over to my good colleague, Congresswoman Fernandez. Thank you so much. I really want to begin my remarks by giving an incredible uh, acknowledgement of humility and gratitude and uh, sort of I hold all of you that stand behind us in such a place of honor. You are heroes for your own committees, whether as we pointed out, is it in, from St. Louis to Navajo to Guam? Because it is these voices, and these are only a few of the hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of voices that must be heard in Congress. And it is the work of you all that has led us to have these voices in Congress. So I am Teresa Ledo Fernandez, and I get to represent the beautiful and beautifully diverse third congressional district of Nuevo Mexico. You know, Jay, I love my district. I, J.R. Oppenheimer, Dr. Oppenheimer was drawn to Los Alamos as a place of great beauty and inspiration. I know that millions of you did see that movie and saw sweeping mesas, open mesas where nobody was there, a top secret town that didn't exist and emerge in a few months. You saw what looked like an empty desert where the bomb was exploded. We know and you didn't see and that it was represented by little marbles, but those little marbles were made and helped to be made by the uranium that was milled by the people in this district. So in New Mexico, in New Mexico, the bomb was invented, the bomb was exploded, and the material for the bomb was mined. Imagine that, all three of those matters, and then the waste was shipped off to those places where it would continue to do harm. And then a decision was made to move the testing to yet another place that the United States thought was uninhabited. And then once again, out to the islands. Because we need to remember that this is the trajectory of what we were doing in the United States. And those of us here today to asking for justice for those communities that were left out are not making any statement about the value of that work. What we are making a statement about is that when we recognize and recognize that it is justice and it is the right thing to do to compensate those who are harmed in the making, the mining, and the exploding of our atomic weapons deserve to receive compensation. They deserve to receive health care. It was a marvelous thing they did in 1992 where they recognized that the downwinders, the miners, the workers deserve the kind of specialized health care that they need to address the harm that is done when you are exposed to these materials. But what was wrong back then was to inadvertently leave out the communities that are represented here behind me from that compensation. And that is the justice, because justice is not complete until it is justice for all, and that is what we are asking for. Justice for everybody who was hurt in the mining. Because we know that there were vibrant communities right there around Los Alamos. They are my friends. They are Senator Lujan's ancestors. Senator Lujan's father worked in Los Alamos. And he might not mention it often, but Senator Lujan's father, who did not spoke, died from lung cancer. But only after leaving us, the amazing Ben Ray Lujan. So we must, I love that language you used, Senator, 
about we must honor them. That's in my notes too, because this is about honoring those who served our nation. They served our nation either mining or simply living within the area that the wind blew the ash. There was a line that was left out of Oppenheimer, the dramatic movie, but is included in other writings where those who were in charge of considering what the nuclear waste, what the fallout would do to New Mexicans said, well, we're pretty sure there was overexposure, but they can't prove it, we can't prove it, so I think we got away with it. We are not gonna let them get away with it. We're gonna make sure there is justice because the last thing I wanna end on is the idea that part of this is to provide the medical services. So we have heard and I have lived and I have good friends of mine who suffered from the mining, you know, the uranium mining. If we could actually get out to all of the miners who mined after 1971 and make sure that they get the health screening, do you have any of these cancers that can be caused from this mining? We could save their lives. So we need to get out there and make sure that we start testing the people in St. Louis and throughout Missouri who were exposed so we can save their lives. We can save lives if we pass this. And so let's hear it for saving lives. And before I go away, senators, senators, you did an amazing thing across the hallway. Woo! And I saw, I saw you working. I saw all of you working on the floor. We were watching and we were crying. We were crying out of pride and the idea that this is the moment, this is the historical moment when this will finally get done. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Now I want to introduce a, a great friend of mine and a man who grew up in these neighborhoods in St. Louis and now represents them in the United States Senate, Senator Eric Schmidt. Thank you. Uh, I, th I think what you're seeing here today is a, is a remarkable uh, showing of what it means when you don't care about party labels, you don't care about the states that uh, divide us, but you come together for the common cause of justice. And that's really what this is all about. And, and I, I know some folks who are behind me, uh, and they are the inspiration. They're the ones who've never given up the fight, not just for their families, but people who've come before them um, to make this right. And as Josh mentioned, uh, I grew up in Bridgeton. I still have family in Bridgeton. I know the neighborhoods. I know the streets. I played in ball fields in Bridgeton. And the number of people who've been impacted by this, but no fault of their own, is, is stunning. And this was their government that dumped co toxic chemicals into their water, into the soil, and lied about it. And now is the time to make that right. Now is the time to come together for the common cause of justice and make sure they get the compensation that they deserve. And I will tell you, I've talked a lot about my hometown and, and where I grew up in North St. Louis County. It is a place where uh, people work hard. They're not, they, they raise their families. They believe in values. And they're willing to fight for those things. And now they're standing here asking for us to fight for them, and that is exactly what we're gonna do. Thank you all for your courage, and we're gonna get this done, thank you. We'd like for you to hear now from just a small sampling of the thousands, probably millions of people who have been affected by this, but the folks whose courage, as, it, as has been so well said, whose courage and tenacity has brought us here today. It's the courage of the folks behind us. It's the courage of the people who would not take no for an answer. And I want to introduce from the state of Missouri, from St. Louis, Don Chapman, who is a hero of mine. Don founded a group called Just Moms in St. Louis and Karen. And uh, you know, Don and Karen, if you think though that they're only moms, you're quite wrong. They have the power of justice behind them. Mothers who are willing to fight for their children, to fight for other people's children, to fight for their communities. They have never given up. They've been told over and over that they were crazy. They were blowing this out of proportion. They've been right all along. And really because of them, we are standing here today. I want Dawn to tell a little bit of her story. Welcome Dawn Chapman. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, everybody. Um, family, step up. Come on, we're all gonna step up a little bit. Yeah, 
Come on, everybody come they'll, forward. They'll be able to see me, don't yep, worry. everybody come forward. <laughs> come forward. Because uh, I think that it's really important. I'm sorry if this isn't the best optic for you guys, but it's really important that families stand together. Family, come forward. Family, Senator Lujan, please come over. Let's make way for our, our friends and our family. Our family's here. We're here. And for the longest time, although we've loved each other across the nation, and we have known what each individual community has gone through, and I think a little bit deliberate, we've been isolated and separated, and that is not happening anymore. That's right. Never again. When you see us, you're going to see us together, and you're going to see family. And we're going to speak truth to what's happened. Because what's happened in my community in St. Louis is the same thing that's happened in theirs. And the same turning of the back and the same level of disrespect, frankly, that we felt from our federal government, it's the same. The same illnesses, the same heartbreak. So we're here together today, and I think the most important thing is this is not a heavy ask. Look at us. We moved a mountain. It was a, a, the bipartisan vote in the Senate. A mountain came down. Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Mountains. Mountains move every single day. And you're going to see another one move real quick in the House. Because we're going to do this. It's time. We're not asking for a handout. That We're asking for the extension of a program that's already in existence. And we're asking for people to be included who frankly this program was created for and why in the world they were left out of it i have no idea we have people who serve their country that will come up and tell their story that crawled into uranium mines and pulled it out in service to their country and it's time that the country step up and help them we are proud of our country we're proud of our communities but we just want to be kept safe and well and be made whole no thank more you lives. No more lies and no more separation. We are one family. Thank you. Don, thank you for your beautiful words. Um, it's incredible how this family continues to grow and the stories that they continue to share. Thank you, Don. Um, I now have the honor of introducing an incredible champion. Um, she serves as the Speaker of the House on the Navajo Nation. And that's none other than Speaker Curley. Crystalline, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, family and relatives. Ado yate she crystal and curly in this year. Send you kin in the shlin, twot head, leany, a bushes chin, kia ani, the she che, do, just caught the kia ani, a dashinella, what's out a son in the shlin. First and foremost, welcome family and friends. Uh, we are joined here with allies and from the Navajo Nation. I extend uh, gratitude to all the media that is here today. I am as Madam Speaker of the Navajo Nation. First and foremost, yeah, thank you so much to Senator Lujan, Senator Crapo, Senator Hawley for their leadership in driving this monumental uh, amendment forward within the Senate and next to the House. And we want to carry it through. We, as a nation, we want to see that happen. On behalf of the Navajo Nation, I stand before you to speak about justice. I know you can hear, hear it repetitively about the responsibility and the debt our country owes to the Navajo Nation and all of the families that we are joined here by today. A debt that has occurred over decades of uranium mining with our Navajo people, pain, pain in the currency of their health, environment, and in some instances their lives to guarantees America's place in this world. From 1944 to 1986, nearly 300 million tons of uranium was extracted from Navajo Nation. It provided economic opportunities for families across the region to build a better life for generation. However, as fast as it started, and the faster it crumbled as well. The lack of communication with our Urani Navajo uranium workers and the negligence to transcribe the risks associated with the exposure to radiation 
has led to generations of illnesses and death across Navajo communities. Without knowledge, Navajo, Navajo people herded livestock to drink the contaminated runoffs in the waters. And many families who live near these uranium mines built, has taken lumber and supplies from these mines to build their homes. And not only that, but our children played within those streams. Today, families are dealt with the heavy price of kidney disease, lung cancer, and the occurring costs of medical care. And today, I am joined here by many of our Diné Navajo miners. And I want to introduce Les Mr. Leslie Begay, yeah. Mary Curley, Phil Harrison, Kathleen Sosi, and Tommy Reed, who had come countless times to the Hill to advocate and for their voices. And I want to share a story about Leslie Kwado Shiyaj. And he has an amazing story that is very heartfelt that will make you cry. And not only that, but he's a veteran, a Marine Corps veteran. And just listening to his story, you know, he, he paid, uh, he served and to protect this country. However, and he was also a mine worker. And during the experiences in the mine, he was rewarded with disease and near-death experiences. He shared the challenges of accessing life-saving medical treatment, but eventually being turned away from the Indian Health Service and Department of Veteran Affairs. Fortunately, Leslie, through just prayers of our Navajo values and just within our thoughts, Leslie was able to receive a double lung transplant. However, <laughs> However, many of our Navajo miners do not have that same luck. And many of our children and our communities still continue to suffer from the mines and the after effects within our communities. And we, we are honored to be here today to support the amendments that was included in the National Defense Authorization Act. And we, we stand behind our leaders, our national leaders, and we are joined here to join that fight that many of our grandfathers and our grandmothers have fought for. And I urge Congress to honor the patriotism of the Navajo people, their service and their sacrifice. So we join you in to just to do what is just, what is right, and what is long overdue. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Madam Speaker, thank you for your words and your wisdom. And you know, Leslie, as Teresa Ledger Fernandez shared, my father, who passed from lung cancer, um, while it had spread, he believed that he needed a stronger lungs, and he would tell us, uh, lend me your breath. Aww. You're lending your breath to many people. You're lending your breath to many people. Thank you. Um, next, we'll hear from Tina Cordova. Um, she is a cancer survivor. She's a co-founder of the Tolerosa Basin Downwinders yeah. Consortium of New Mexico, Woo! and just a great person. Tina. So I'm not an elected official, but the people of New Mexico have joined with me and sent me here to be a voice for them. And I represent the people in New Mexico that lived as close as 12 miles to where they detonated the first bomb in the desert of New Mexico. They didn't warn us before or afterwards. We didn't have running water. We collected the rain that fell from the sky for every purpose, drinking, cooking, bathing. They didn't have the decency to let us know that as that ash fell from the sky for days afterwards, that it would completely contaminate our water supply. We didn't have electricity, so we had no grocery stores. Everything we ate, we produced by our own means. They didn't warn us before or afterwards. I'm the fourth generation in my family to have cancer since 1945, and this is what a fifth generation looks like. My 23-year-old niece going to college in California, now diagnosed with thyroid cancer, her life upended the same way mine was when I was 39 and diagnosed with thyroid cancer. First question they asked me, 
When were you exposed to radiation? And I wish I could say that my family is unique. We are not. Her family, her family, his family, all of their families. This is our history. This is the legacy of the nuclear development and testing that took place in our country during the Cold War and before. And it is time for justice. And I want to honor Senator Lujan. For 13 years, yeah. we have had bills introduced yeah. in the US Congress, and this is the closest we've ever been. Yeah. 13 years, never a vote on the Senator House floor. Thank you, Senator Hawley, for delivering the yeah. votes that you did yeah. to bring us to this point. Yeah. We will never go away. Right. We will never yeah. go away. There are generations standing behind us whose genes carry this legacy. We will never be siloed again, like Don said. We have been yeah. spread across this country, unable to work together. That doesn't take place anymore. We are now one in this fight for justice. And again, I want to thank you. We honor you. We realize that we don't have to explain to you the difference between right and wrong, that inherently you understand that, and that you stand with us for justice, and we will never stop fighting. We will no, never stop no, fighting. No, no, no. Tina, thank you so very much. Next, we'll hear from another friend, incredible community leader, Phil Harrison. Yay. Phil is a former uranium worker and a founding member of the Navajo Uranium Radiation Victims Committee. Phil, thank you so very much, sir. The floor is yours. And as Phil comes up, um, Representative Malloy, in my excitement to introduce you, I mispronounced your name, Delegate. <laughs> so I want to apologize, but thank you so much, Representative Moylan, for all the work you do. Phil, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, uh, Senator Lohan, and thank you, Senator Holly. Uh, Mullen and all the, the members of Congress that have uh, really been uh, recognizing what our people has gone through. I'm Phil Harrison and uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. I am the, the uh, spokesperson for a grassroots committee called the Navajo Uranium Radiations Victims Committee which was organized back in 1978. Uh, we were here in 1990, we did the first uh, RICA law. We were here in July 2000. We did the amendment. Congress told us to come back for those uh, changes that were not included. So here we are today. Uh, we've been here in Washington to uh, continue to tell America how freedom was established. I always have said that when the Navajo miners, little did they know what they were doing. They were uneducated. They couldn't read and write. They were given a shovel simply to feed their families put food and clothes on the table. We grew up in a boarding school, and I know my father did that. You know, little that he knew that, that he was being contaminated, contaminating his family, our, my siblings, and all the Navajo people that engage in mining and milling of yellow cane. People have been hurt. People have been hurt. They were untreated unfairly. A small compensation that didn't even last. They lost a lot of life. When in the Western world, you talk about American dream. Our people that engage in mining uranium did not reach that American dream. My father was 43 years old when he died from lung cancer. How sad is that? He had high hopes for his family. 400 of my Navajo relatives in the community of Cove, Arizona, Red Valley, Arizona, over 400 men died from lung disease, lung cancer, kidney failure. That's what we're living with. Today, we kind of lost hope. People will tell us that we're going to Washington. We're going to go tell our leaders. You know what? You know what they're saying? They won't listen to us. That's not going to happen. People die very quietly. In the last two months, I facilitated three funerals all related to cancer and lung disease. But let me tell you that, I always have often said that the Navajo Uranium miners, all those other miners, the Laguna miners, 
they provided that recipe for the bomb, the Oppenheimer bomb. We provided that element. That was during the Cold War era. We protected national security so you all can have freedom. We suffered. And I'm a former uranium miner, and I'm also a former DO Department of Energy remediation worker. I put away contaminated materials, and guess what? My kidneys failed. I thought I just had a mosquito bite. Rash all over my body. Doctors told me that you're ready for dialysis. What is dialysis? Eight hours a day, I drank that water in the mine. Nobody told me, don't drink that, don't eat in there. Majority of our people were, couldn't read and write and understand. I don't even think they knew what being patriotic means. We dealt with that. Ladies and gentlemen, I grew up, my backyard, did mining from 1950 to 1966. 73 years later, I live right by the highway. They're hauling debris. 73 years later, they're barely, barely pushing out the uh, contaminated materials. Before all this mining, Navajos were happy. They were having ceremonies, family gatherings. They were planting, they had farms. Now, no more farming. The companies never get anything that will be sustainable. We're dealing with death. We're dealing with uh, families that are anger because our moms are also diagnosed with pulmonary disease and kidney failure. Each community, almost every community, they have a, a dialysis center where people go. Mm -hmm. We don't have that medical expertise. We don't have facilities. This is re very frustrating. I'd like to see our honorable members of Congress, every one of them, to support the uh, NDAA and the RECA. Let's put a closure on this for yeah. American yeah. citizens. Yeah. Yeah. Once and for all. I've been here so many times I still get lost in the halls of Congress. <laughs> but this is one of our last trips again. You know, we don't get paid for what we're doing. We don't get paid for what we're doing. We, I have an annual golf tournament that I do. That's how I raise my funds to come to Washington to pay for Social Security for our people, to pay for chest X-ray B readings. That's how we use the money. And I'll tell you one more thing. We had co talkers that were minors too. Yeah. A large portion of Navajo youth are in the military. I served in the United States Air Force when I came back. I said, Mr. Harrison, I think you can speak English pretty well. Why can't you be our representative? Let's get this justice done for our Navajo miners and the rest of the nation. What we have done for the Navajo Nation, we played a key role for everybody. My friends here, we, uh, they benefited. So thank you for being here today. Thank you, Senators. Let's get this done. Let's get this done. All right, thank you. Thank you, Brother Phil. I appreciate that. And last, we'll hear from Mary Dixon, who is a leader coming out of Utah, a downwinder from Salt Lake City, Utah. First of all, thank you so much to all these people behind me. You are my heroes. All of you, all of you that I've been fortunate enough to work with in this very, very important and very lonely and very depressing work. It gives me hope to see them. It gives me hope to see all of you because you are the conduit for our stories. I hope you take that as, as one of your charges. You know, the movie Oppenheimer, I don't know how many have seen it. In the end, when Oppenheimer's speaking to Einstein, he says, we didn't know if we would destroy the world. And Einstein says, and he goes, I believe we did. Well, I will tell you, he destroyed our worlds. We are his legacy. We are the legacy of that bomb. And it was just the first bomb exploded on our soil. I want you to think about this. There were 928 nuclear weapons detonated in the desert of Nevada. 928, all more powerful than those that leveled Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And a hundred of those were above ground. And that fallout went everywhere. This is where it went. When I show this, people are stunned. They're just absolutely stunned. And you know that fallout 
It fell to the ground in the rain, the snow, the sleet, the hail, and it worked its way into the biosphere and into our bodies. I had thyroid cancer in my 20s, which meant I had to drink radioactive iodine, which also had problems. Years later, I had to have a complete hysterectomy because of tumors. I can't have children because of what my government did. And I'm not the only one. My sister, my older sister died, leaving three children behind that I've tried to help raise. My younger sister has stomach cancer, another autoimmune diseases. And just the night I arrived, I was awakened in the middle of the night by another sister who told me her daughter now has thyroid cancer. In the neighborhood I grew up in, in Salt Lake City, we counted 54 people who had different cancers, autoimmune disorders, tumors, and illnesses related to radiation. We have been fighting this fight for literally decades. Decades. This, as Tina said, as others have said, it's the closest we've come to justice. Because it didn't just happen to us, there are so many others like us, tens of thousands. And you know, if we hear that we must be fiscally responsible, I ask you, what is the life of my sister worth? What are the lives of your families worth? There can be no amount that can make up for their lives. We've spent $12 trillion since the Manhattan Project on nuclear weapons, those very weapons that made us sick. We are asking for a mere fraction of that for the harm it caused. And it's not just physical, it's emotional, it's financial. You know, every time I feel a lump, every time I get sick, I worry that it's happening again. And we have buried and mourned the dead, and we have comforted and advocated for the living, and we have waited years, years for justice. I think this is our best shot, and we hope Congress will help us in this. It's, as everyone said, it's the right thing to do. It's bipartisan. We want all of Congress to know that this is what we are owed by a government that knowingly poisoned us, and not just once, but over and over and over again. Right. Yeah. And it's that cumulative exposure that is the most dangerous. So all of these folks from Missouri, our friends who have mined in the uranium, they got double doses because they were also downwinders. So they got double doses. Um, I just hope that Congress does the right thing at last and stands on the right side of history for all of us because we are still here. We are still here. It's, it's uh, my great pleasure also to introduce a good representative from Guam, from, uh, from RICO, that has been working really hard uh, to ensuring all, uh, everything is concluded and including Guam as well. I'd like to do, introduce Mr. Robert Celestero, please. Thank you very much, Congressman Moylan, Senator Hawley, Senator Lahan, Congresswoman Hernandez, and all my friends from the Navajo Nation, Utah, and New Mexico and, and Missouri. 1977, I was sent to the Marshall Islands to clean up 67 nuclear bombs. And just this year, I was awarded an Atomic Veteran Certificate and a medal to be an Atomic Veteran. I have two Atomic Veterans, Ken Bernal and Doc, back here with me. But that's not why I'm here. The island of Guam was devastated from 1946 to 1962 and kept secret to 1994 through the Human Radiation Experiments Advisory Committee through President Clinton. And I want to thank Tina Cordova, Mary Dixon, Phil Harrison, and everyone else behind me because we've been fighting this for almost 22 years. And I really truly believe that the House can pass this bill. They can, and they should. All the speeches I heard today it's compelling. It's compelling because people are dying, and my people are dying. I want to thank Congressman Moylan for having me have a chance. 
I flew 17 hours from Guam to here. 11 hours from Japan to Houston, three hours from Houston to DC, and then I gotta go back to Guam. Because it's a very important issue. People fly from New Mexico, Missouri. Why? Because we have a commonality. We're suffering. Our families have died. And it's people like Senator Hawley, I call him the miracle man. Because because we've been doing this for 20 some years and all of a sudden we watch the TV and here he is passing a bill in the Senate and we're saying, wow, my goodness. So the House can do the same thing. They can pass this thing for the people. I want to say God bless you and, and I believe through the power of the grace of Jesus Christ, it's going to be done. Amen. Anybody, is there anybody else who'd like to say anything? Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Good afternoon, I am Arlene Chermaya Wanico and I'm from the Puebla Laguna out in New Mexico. Our, villi our reservation, ha our Puebla has six villages, Puati being one of them. At one time, Puati, um, Anaconda Uranium Open Pit Mine was the largest open pit mine in the U.S. This is my backyard. I live within two mi one to two miles from this mine. And can you imagine our elders that didn't know the dangers of radiation? Can you imagine how many people we have lost on our reservation? That is why we are all here. Not only for the money, the money will help pay for medical, medical bills. The money will help our people travel because we don't have a hospital nearby. We have to travel 100 miles north, 100 miles west, about 200 miles south, and all the way down to Phoenix, Arizona, just so our miners can get help. Right. Now this, we need the justice for it. Yes. We pray, we, we say the Pledge of Allegiance, right? All of us, yes. the last words are, and justice for all. That's right. Yeah. We yeah. want that justice for yeah. all. And I hope they fulfill that word, justice. Thank you. We are uh, happy to take your questions wow. with that. Okay. That's, oh, no, I'm just kidding. Yes, Raquel, go ahead. Well, I don't know. I mean, Ben Ray, Ben Ray's a veteran of the House. I just have to say, and I'll, I'll let him speak to that if he wants to. Um, I just have to say, Raquel, that listen, we got 61 votes in the United States Senate. I was saying, I don't think you could get National Ice Cream Day to pass in the United States Senate with 61 votes these days. That was a big bipartisan vote. This is not this justice for these people. For these hardworking Americans, is not this isn't partisan politics at all. So I, I'm to answer your question, I'm pretty darn hopeful. I really am. I'm pretty darn yeah, hopeful right. that whatever else. I, I know there's all kinds of controversy about this, that, and the other, but you know this is an example of Congress can actually get something done, and that we can work across the aisle. I've loved working with Ben Ray. I hope this is the. There's a lot of things we can do together, but yeah, let's get this yeah. done, and I, I really think we can. Do you want to add? Yeah. yeah. Raquel, for, for decades. These families and these leaders have been working to get this done. And for that amount of time, um, every time we succeed in advancing policy in one way or another, someone would say no or we would fail on the floor. This package is alive. Yes, yes. 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 And, yes. and I'm hopeful. Um, look, there's a lot that is said about the House and the Senate and the legislative branch of government when it's not working, there's still people talking. And what I always see about this place and why I'm so proud to work here is in the end it works. You can succeed, you can get things done. And here's an example where families came together, which united Josh and I and Representative Moylan and Teresa Ledger Fernandez and our brothers and sisters in Utah and 
Schmidt, and so many others, Senator Crapo of Idaho, to get this done. But most folks said it couldn't. So I'm always optimistic and prayerful that we can get this done. There's challenges in front of us, but I believe that there will be a solution to this impasse. People will move forward. We'll be able to find not just a continued resolution, but we'll be able to get things funded. And in, in that path, we'll be able to pass a National Defense Authorization Act that will include these RECA amendments. We'll get a farm bill passed as well. This work will get done. So I'm optimistic that once people get together, they chat a little bit more, I often say get a good night's sleep, <laughs> rest a little bit, maybe get a good meal, come to work in a, in a good place with good energy. You can move mountains here. And, and, and I'm optimistic that it can happen. Yeah. 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 So on the, on the House side, I will tell you that I have raised this issue with my colleagues. I've raised it with leadership on our side of the aisle. I think there is universal understanding about the right, uh, that this is the right thing to do. The fact that the Senate has it and the NDAA really is, is huge because last year we were able to get a bipartisan eight Republicans out of judiciary, uh, voted uh, the bill out of judiciary. So it's got strong, it's got a history of bipartisan support and, and past uh, Congresses. And it's in the Senate bill. We, we just voted today. Uh, uh, well, we're, we're doing our instructions for the NDAA today. And, you know, we are both talking, both uh, Representative Mar Marlin and I are talking to colleagues on, on our side of the aisle and colleagues on the other side of the aisle. So I have talked to many Republican leaders about this, and I'm hopeful that it stays in. And because it is in, that's always the hardest part. Yeah. And it is in, and so it's like, keep it yeah. in. Yeah. 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 Other question? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yes, sir. Um, Senator Hawley, what yeah. are you doing to reach out to your colleagues to get this passed? And how hard do you think it would be to achieve bipartisan well, I hope not hard I mean, for the reasons that you just heard from the representative. I mean, there has been bipartisan support for this in the past in the House. We have a big bipartisan vote just now in the United States Senate. Uh, and uh, I'm talking to anybody who will listen. I tell you, my colleagues are very are going to be very tired of hearing from me and already are. So uh, we'll leave no stone unturned. And uh, I, I just I'm very, very hopeful. So listen, I, we've got a ways to go here. I mean, we've got to get it through conference. But I am very, very hopeful, and I don't know how you can look at 61 votes on the floor of the United States Senate and not say, wow, that's a big deal. That is a yeah. big deal. Yeah. And I just advise you, reporters, you want to have some fun? Yeah. Go pull the list. Go pull the list of names and go look at the names. Yeah. Go look at the Republicans yeah. who voted for this. I think you'd be surprised. Yeah. I think it will show you how broad the coalition yeah. is here. So for that reason, I'm, I'm very, very hopeful. Woo! Yeah, Daniel. Woo! Yeah. 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 Listen, we want to appeal to everybody. I mean, I, I disagree what was said at this podium a little while ago. Everybody should vote for this. Every member of Congress should vote for this because I'll tell you right now the number of states that are affected. Here's the number of states who have minors or downwinders or those from like our community that were exposed to radioactive waste. Here's the number of states, 50, all 50. So, you know, as I said to my colleagues as they came to the Senate floor on the well, as Ben Ray was talking about, he and I, Ben Ray and I were standing down there. By the way, he is, he is underplayed. You know, Ben Ray delivered every single Democrat vote. But one. And that wasn't his fault. I mean, that's pretty impressive show. And what we would say as people came down is, they would say, well, I don't think this affects my state. And I'd say, oh, yes, it does. And I said, so you've got so many uranium miners in your state. Are you gonna, how are you going to tell them that you don't want them to get the health care they deserve? So, Daniel, we, the point is, who are we targeting? Everybody. Who's affected by this? Everybody. Who are we reaching out to? Everybody. This ought to be something that everybody can get behind. I believe that 100%. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. There's an active cleanup going on right now at Janet Elementary yeah. School. Yeah. Well, listen, here I was just told today or just talking to folks from St. Louis who are behind me, and the sign from Jana, right? Actually, you're telling me this. The sign, the sign from, from Jana Elementary has now been taken down, symbolizing the fact that because of what the government is telling us, the Army Corps, there's no path to reopen that school. So what does justice look like? Number one, it looks like cleaning it up, for heaven's sake. I mean, what's going on at Jana now is the, the Army Corps is trucking out 
Truckloads. How many? How much was it? Three hundred and one dump truckloads of radioactive waste. Three hundred and one dump truckloads of radioactive waste from right near Jana. Now listen, just two months ago they were telling us there is no radioactive waste nearby. No reason to be concerned. Now they are carting it out. And they're also telling the community, though, you're just going to have to live with it. We're not going to reopen the school. That school needs to be reopened. But I'll also say this, because a lot of folks have mentioned this. You know, where's the hope? I mean, wh where do you, what can you do with a problem like this that seems so huge? I tell you what you can do. You can pay the medical bills of everybody who has suffered because of it. That's what yeah. this bill would do. Yeah. So let's yeah. do that. Let's do it. We're almost there. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Yeah. Anybody else? Ben Ray, do you want to say anything else? Thank, thank, you thank you all. Thank you, all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You need a Janet Tiger shirt.